and uh, good morning to all. Today we actually uh, begin with, and thanks to Ethan for leading us in songs as well as reading a text for us over in the book of Judges chapter 2. But today we do have a theme as well as a title. And the theme of it puts, uh, you know, it puts the text into context as to what is happening. I, I hope you find um, biblical history, uh, you know, uh, helpful and, and important. I, I, I truly and personally find it um, fascinating you know, to see how things appear and continued throughout the Old Testament into the New. It brings a, it brings a sort of putting together the puzzle that uh, so often uh, bring confusion at times. But here the text tells us that tears that dry too quickly in reference to the children of Israel and the theme tells us generations that follow. And we have to appreciate the fact that when God called Abraham, he called him and gave him a promise to have, you know, children. And, and those would be the generations that followed. And today our passage, our text would sort of lead us into some of the errors some of the disappointments, some of the happenings that occurred during a particular period known as the Judges. So in my introduction, I want to help us to appreciate the term generations. And when we speak about a generation, we are referencing actually a period of about 20 or 30 years. It varies. Uh, this is no science, uh, but it covers a, a specific period. And to make it simple, a generation really is all uh, the people on one level of a family tree. For example, it would be you, your brothers and your sisters, and possibly your cousins. They would have been part of the same generation. A family today may consider itself fortunate if they can produce a photograph with at least four generations highlighted, namely great-grandparents or parent, grandparents, parent, and the child. I, I, I don't know if anyone here uh, has a photo like that. Maybe Sammy could recall, um, you know, those four generations of herself, her parents, you know, her grandparents and great-grandparents. You know, I myself, I can only go back so far. I think of, uh, well, I know my parents. I knew one grandmother. I saw a picture of one grandfather and never knew the rest, you know. So it, it, it's, it's difficult in today's generation to, you know, to have that trace back. Yet, the story that we find in the book of Ruth can trace back several generations, how they did it. They recorded it. And if we were to look at the end of the book of Ruth, the writer of this book traced back from King David, all the way back to one called Perez. And it, it ended like this. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez being the son of Judah, one of the 12 tribes. To Perez was born Hezron, and to Hezron was born Ram, and to Ram Abinadab, and to Abinadab was born Nashon and to Nashon, Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz. This is one of the key figures in the book of Ruth. And to Boaz was born Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse was born David. 
if you go to the first chapter in Matthew, a chapter we didn't read when we started our recent consecutive reading, you would see a genealogy from the Lord Jesus Christ dating all the way back to Abraham, including Perez and Boaz and Jesse and Obed and all these that were just named. How did they do that? And, and we today, in all the technology that we have, we can only go back so far. But God had a plan to preserve for us his word. And so it's, it's there for us. So we may not be able to trace very far back in our genealogy. But for the Israelites, the significance of their genealogy traced back to the origins, to their origins. It documented who they were as a people. It indicated which of the 12 tribes they belonged to, and it specified who they served as their God. And, and that's the key right there in the reason God preserved the genealogy of the Israelite people so that they can trace back and they can know who, which God they serve. This generational significance also carried with it, with it a responsibility to teach the generation that followed the value and importance of knowing their origins and knowing God. There's a verse in Deuteronomy, in fact, two verses, Deuteronomy 6 and 7, says this. Moses is speaking to the children of Israel. Remember the history. Remember they had been delivered from Egypt, and they were under Moses' care. And he was teaching them, you know, what God had showed him. And he said this to them. These words which I command you today says to God's people, shall be on your heart, verse 7, and you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and speak to them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. And a little backward on verse 2, he says to them this, so that, Remember, I spoke some time ago, I said, always look for that phrase, so that. It gives us a reason. Your son and your grandson will fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I commanded you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. So this is the reason God gave Moses this command so that this generation can teach the next generation who would res be responsible for the next generation to tell them who God is and where they came from. That was a simple requirement. We may call it a recipe. It's a simple recipe for the children of God to preserve the understanding of who God is to the next generation. It's a responsibility today, today that same recipe remains the same. It's for us as parents to teach the next generation who will be responsible for the next and the next. It's not only a job for the Sunday school teacher or for the preacher or for anyone else. It's for one generation to teach the next. When you lie down, when you walk the street, you know, when you get up, teach them the things of God. During the period of the judges, however, we witness the struggles and the failure of Israel to carry out this requirement. To teach the next, next generation the things of God and the consequences that followed characterized them as being wretchedly corrupt and wretchedly oppressed by their neighbors. And so here they were, under the management of Joshua and uh, the responsibilities that they failed to carry out was able to identify them later on as being wretchedly corrupt 
and wretchedly oppressed by their neighbors. We also see God's grace and faithfulness in keeping his promise by sending to them judges over a period of time, one by one. Sometimes they, uh, they, they work side by side, one with the other. But he sent them judges during this period to bring deliverance to a delinquent people. You see, God is sovereign and he knows all and he acknowledges that his children were not being obedient and the consequences that will follow. And so what he did, he would send a deliverer, a judge during this time. Whenever the children of Israel cried out to God, which they did, from the oppression of their neighbors, God answered their cry for help. You know, later on, many years outside the period of Judges, when David, King David came on the scene, he understood very well what it meant to cry out to God under oppression or under severe stress. And so his words in Psalm 143 and verse 1 says, O Lord, this is how David would begin his prayer, his cry out, O Lord, listen to my prayer. It seems as though one is commanding another, but this is not David. He is crying out to the God whom he served, the, the one who God said he is after my own heart. And David would say, oh Lord, listen to my prayer. Open your ears to hear my urgent request and answer me, God, because you are faithful and righteous. Psalm 120, 143, 1. List it. Repeat it. It's a cry for help. Today, God does the same for all believers who cry out to him in tears and in despair. He listens, and we can cry out to him as David did, as the children of Israel did, and God would respond to their cries. Sin has consequences, but God provides forgiveness and salvation. To help us to grasp this period of the judges, we need to uh, fill in the gaps a bit, go into a little background, a little history as to what this period entail. The period of the judges began with the death of Joshua, and ended with the coronation of Saul. You, you would remember that Saul became the first king when the children of Israel cried out, you know, God, send us a leader. <laughs> you know, this was a, a critical time for them. They spent almost about 300 years in this period of the judges without a leader per se, except when God sent a deliverer in the form of a judge. And so when Moses led the children of Israel, it was understood by all that Moses was the leader. And then when Moses' term was coming to an end, he appointed a successor in the form of Joshua. But when Joshua's term came to an end, unfortunately, he didn't appoint a leader, a successor. Hence, the children of Israel would living in a period without one leading them. It's a dangerous place to be. I know we here at Westside had been um, seeking and hoping and trusting that we would, you know, appoint a leader, a shepherd. And that is critical. Of course, it's not just one person that leads the the, the church today, it's, 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 a, it's a team. It's, it's, it's what you call the shepherding team of elders. And so it's very, very important that a church conducts the business working with the leaders. And so historically, the book of Judges is characterized by words that 
were put at the end of the book of Judges. And it reads like this. As the days were, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, that's a dangerous place to be where every voice has the right to do as they please. That's not how the church of God is run today. That's not how God wanted his people, the Israelites, to conduct their business then. But because there was no king, because there was no leader over the 12 tribes, it says, as the days were there, there was no king in Israel Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Interestingly, the book of Ruth, which emanated around the very same time of the judges, we get the beautiful story occurring right there in the book of Ruth. And some of you may be familiar with the book of Ruth, where uh, the man Elimelech, took his family, Naomi and his two sons, and they left because of the chaos, because of the famine, because of what was happening in the state of Israel, and they left for a foreign land. Was that a good choice? We could research that and determine whether it was or not, but we found out that all three male uh, Persons in that story, Elimelech and his two sons, Marlon and Chilon, they died. And so Naomi is left with her two daughters-in-law. Daughters -in -law, and uh, when time came for her to return, she took Ruth with her, who said, I will go with you. And so the two came back to Bethlehem, where they resided before. And the beautiful story uh, you know, unfolds, where Ruth now meets Boaz. And the story tells us that Ruth and Boaz became the great-grandparents of King David. What a beautiful story it was. Even in the time of the judges where everyone did, not everyone, but it says men did as they thought was right in their own eyes. So beauty can still come from ashes as it did in the book of Ruth. So when Joshua took over the reins from Moses and entered the promised land, remember Moses did not have that opportunity as Joshua did to enter into the promised land. He broke the backs of the Canaanite military armies and their allies as, just, as Moses commanded him to do. Throughout the land, the servant of God led his armies into many battles of victory. One by one, he became victorious and he conquered, it would seem, the land for the 12 tribes. After Joshua divided the land, he gave each tribe their own portion according to their size. So if your size was as big as Judah, you got a big chunk in the land of Israel. And if your tribe was as small as Dan, you got a smaller portion. And so what he did, he allowed each tribe to return to its inheritance. And Joshua then reiterated the command God gave to Moses. And basically what he was telling them comes in three parts. Complete the occupation of the land. Eliminate the local inhabitants and destroy the pagan altars. So that was their responsibility. He, he, dis, he, he dismissed them after the land was conquered and he told them, continue with these three responsibilities. Complete the occupation. You see, even though they had conquered the land that is now known as the promised land, the land of Israel, yet there were pockets of Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, and, and the various tribes that were opposed to God. 
still living in pockets of the land. It's a huge space. And so the, Joshua said to them, okay, now go to your parcel of land and continue getting rid of the enemy, the Canaanites, etc. And so that was their responsibility. Eliminate the local inhabitants and destroy the pagan altars. That was very, very key as part of their responsibility. In general, this was accomplished during the lifetime of Joshua and the elders that surrounded him in that generation. But there were still large areas to be possessed by the individual tribes. And here's where the problem began. Instead of removing the enemy, the Canaanites from the land, the tribes accommodated them by placing them into forced labor. Over in chapter 1 of Judges, we read from verse 21. But the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem, so the Jebusites have lived with the sons of Benjamin in Ju Jerusalem to this day. Likewise, the house of Joseph, over in verse 27. But Manasseh did not take possession of Bethshin, and so on and so on. And in verse 28, and it came about when Israel became strong, in other words, when they were able to have a hold on these pockets of inhabitants, that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Neither did Ephraim, Zebulun, Asher, Naphtali, none of the tribes did according to the instructions Joshua had left, which simply was complete the occupation of the land, eliminate the local inhabitants, and get rid of the pagan altars. Moses in Deuteronomy, he said, he said to them, make no accommodation with the enemy. Intermarriages occurred, something that was prohibited between the Israelites and the Canaanites, followed by the worship of idols, something that angered God. So all of this makes up the history of the children of Israel living during this period known as the period of the judges. The rise of the Canaanites and their allies over individual tribes resulted in cries of oppression. These cries were heard by God, and so God sent deliverers in the form of judges to these tribes during this period of oppression. And so, during this period, God raised up his chosen deliverers whom he anointed with his spirit to rescue his people because God still took charge of this group of people even through their delinquents and disobedience and idolatry unto him. The purpose of the book was to demonstrate God's divine judgment on Israel and its apostasy. The influence of the Canaanites, and this is what plays key in our study today, the influence of the Canaanites over the Israelites led to moral and social and spiritual decay. Today the church of God is surrounded with similar influences of moral and social decay. And many, like the Israelites then, succumb to spiritual decay. The influences around us today are of such that it decays us through moral and social decay, resulting in our spiritual decline. But for the love of God for his children, God extends his grace and mercy by sending a preacher. We read about it in chapter 2. He sent a preacher to warn his children before it was too late. And as this passage that Ethan read, verse 1 says, Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal, and 
we would look at as to who this angel is. Chapters 2 and 1 to 5 speaks about the angel of the Lord delivers, delivers an awakening sermon to the Israelites when they began to cool off in their religion. You see, God will always send a warning to us, recognizing that we are going contrary to his word. In this case, he sent them a preacher, an angel of God, to deal with this delinquent people. And that there were consequences if the people did not heed his word. The following points describe the contents and response of this sermon. And we will go through them quickly. The first one, there was a preacher, an angel of the Lord, with a message from God. Verse 1, this was no ordinary angel. This was not like the angel Gabriel who was named, you know, in the gospel of Luke that attended to Mary and informed her that she was about to, to uh, become the mother of the Son of God. This was not that type of angel. This angel actually was but a theophany, meaning this was an appearance of the second person of the Trinity. This was an appearance of Jesus before the incarnation. How do we know this? Well, this type of appearance occurred during the lifetime of Moses and Joshua. And here it is. It's appearing again for a specific reason to bring a warning. Prior to that, the angel would appear to give instructions to Moses and to Joshua how to deal with this battle, how to execute, you know, God's will for the people. But in this case, God sends a preacher, an angel of God. It would seem it was Jesus himself. We know the angel was God because who else could write the words of verse 1? Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to watch him, and he said, I, <laughs> notice how it is written, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land which I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So here the angel is not speaking on behalf of God. He's speaking like God himself. That's the seriousness of the crimes or of the sins of the children of Israel that God sent his son to warn them. Joshua had previously warned the children of Israel of entangling themselves with the Canaanites, but they listened not to a dying man. No, they have to listen to the living God. You see, Joshua had warned them, even at the point of his death, he said, don't mingle with the Canaanites, and he gave them instructions. And of course, they listened not. Now they have to listen to God himself, the living God. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25, it says, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. It's a serious thing when God is giving the instruction, when God is giving the warning as compared to when Moses was giving the warning or Joshua was giving the warning. Today we may receive a warning from someone. Maybe it's a, a boss. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's a, someone in authority. And we may choose to listen. But when God gives a warning, we need to heed his word. And thirdly, this angel came from Gilgal. It says in verse 1, Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal. If we know the location of Gilgal, it would help us to recognize the importance of why the angel came from Gilgal. 
when Joshua took his tribes across the Jordan River, right after they met uh, Jericho, they, they had to overcome uh, the battle of Jericho. But they camped at a place called Gilgal. And Gilgal be became like their headquarters where they would, Joshua would go before God to get instructions. And so Gilgal was very, very critical and crucial in their understanding as hearing from God. And here it says this angel came from Gilgal. Now Jesus could have come from anywhere. He is God. But it gave them the opportunity to see that this was important because they reserved Gilgal and they revered Gilgal as a place of instruction. So the angel came from Gilgal. It was from there Joshua received his spoken instructions from God. If we were to apply that, God did not abandon his straying lambs. They were straying. They were disobedient. They were indulging in idolatry. They were intermarrying. God did not abandon his straying lambs when they sinned. And he would not abandon his straying lambs today. That's you and I. He spoke directly then as an angel. Today he speaks directly to us from his word. We need to take heed. So secondly, not only was there a preacher in the form of an angel with a message from God. Secondly, the hearers were the children of God. This is not no message to just anyone. This was a message to the children of God. And as a church, we need to recognize when a message from God comes to his church and to respond. This great preacher had a great message for a great people who fell into great sin. <laughs> let, me, let me say that again. This great preacher had a great message for a great people who fell into great sin. Man's greatest failure is sin, but God's greatest antidote is his word. It's a good time to encourage you to get into God's word. We do it here every Sunday. We read a chapter a week. But it's insufficient for you and I to count on that one chapter a week. We need to get into God's word. It is where we get the instructions for the church. It is where we get the instructions to live righteously. And it says in verse 4, and it came about when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel. I want us to underline that word, all the sons of Israel, all. They were gathered for purpose. When the children of Israel during that period of conquering the promised land, whenever they gathered, it was for two reasons, one of two. They gathered when they were summoned for war. You know, when a tribe may call on another tribe or two to come together to help, you know, get rid of the enemy. And so they may summon together a couple tribes, two or three tribes. They were gathered for war. But there was another reason why all the children of Israel would gather together. And that was for worship. There were three occasions each year that the children of Israel were commanded to, uh, the heads of homes were, were, were commanded to meet for worship. And there were three uh, reasons or three feasts that they were commanded to attend to. The first was the Passover. It was, uh, Passover was made up of a week of unleavened bread. And, 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 and so it was really the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was preceded by the Passover remembrance, you know, where, where the dead angel, you know, was supposed to go through that. And uh, we, we sort of highlight that sometimes during our communion service, uh, you know, that's what the children of Israel remembered. And the heads of homes 
would be required to attend that. Sometimes they would take their wives and their children with them. We know of uh, Elkanah, the husband of Hannah. He had another wife as well, Puan, uh, Penaniah, if I get it correctly. And Penaniah would always uh, humiliate Hannah because Hannah was barren. Hannah was Elkanah's first wife. And, and so when the time came for worship, Elkanah would take his wives and children to Shiloh where the, 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 the tabernacle was. And so that's where they worship along with all the other men and sometimes wives and children. And, uh, and we know the story of Hannah. It was there at Shiloh that she prayed she went into the tabernacle and she prayed and asked God for a son. She did this repeatedly until God answered her prayer. And her son came and his son's name was Samuel. Samuel was the last of the judges just prior to the coronation of Saul. And so this makes up the part of the history. But the children of Israel met, they all met for three reasons, for two reasons. One was war and the other one was to worship. And uh, the first occasion of worship for the year was Passover. The second reason, the second period that they were commanded to worship was for to celebrate Passo uh, Pentecost. And so that was another occasion, another feast, you know, that they were called upon to worship. And of course, the third one uh, would have been the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles where they celebrated how the children of Israel you know, uh, lived in booths during the uh, search for the promised land, etc. And so these were the three feasts that all Israel, all heads of homes were required to meet. So when the verse tells us in verse 4, and it came about when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, this preacher was preaching to all. It was a time where they would hear from God, but you had to be there. You had to attend worship to hear from God. And so... The application we can draw from this is that the church today must gather for the same reason, to worship God and to hear from him. That's why we come together. We don't come together to, to fight with each other. We don't come together to discuss things of the world. We come together to worship him and to hear from him. That's why we come together. That's why God summons us, summons his church to do it repeatedly so that we can hear from him and we can worship him. On this occasion, only those present heard the voice of the angel. Those who were not present had to get the message secondhand. They would have to, uh, whoever was there would have to go back to their homes and say, you know, you know what the angel said? But what a joy it was to be there present and to hear from God himself. They had to be present. We need to be present to hear from God. And interestingly, we mentioned about Hannah. It was because she went along with her husband Elkanah to Shiloh to worship with him. She was able to bring her requests before God. That's where she brought it. She could have prayed silently at home, but she saw the need to go to worship, to lay her requests before God. So yes, there was a priest, there was a preacher, and there was a message to all. Thirdly, the sermon itself was short, but very personal. You know, sometimes we can spend in our quiet times long periods you know, uh, before God. But really, his message is usually a short message, but very, very pointed and personal to us. God told them plainly in verse 1. He says, I brought you up 
out of Egypt and I led you into the land and so we can go through it. What he had done for them, he said, I brought you up and led you into the land. He, God then revisited his blessings to the Israelites. It's a short message, but it's very personal. He wanted them to remember who he was and what he did for them. The message began with I. This is what I did for you. Secondly, what he had promised them. And we always need to go through the promises of God with a fine tooth, you know, uh, reading through the lines. His promise to them was simply this. I will never break my covenant with you. A promise God still keeps with his church today in Matthew uh, 28 and verse 20. The verse simply says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I was, I was listening to a preacher one time that said he was preaching this word, and in the audience was a Chinese man whose name was Lo. <laughs> and when he read, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, Lo took it personally, <laughs> as we should. I am with you. That's how God gives his message. It's short, but it's direct and personal. And we need to apply it to ourselves personally. Thirdly, what were his just and reasonable expectations? When God spoke as to what he did and what he has promised, he expected something from the Israelites. In verse, in verse 2, and as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you have not obeyed me. Let's look at verse 2. It says, and as for you, you shall make no covenant. The Israelites accommodated the Canaanites. They thought it was a good strategic plan to place them into forced labor. Let them work for us. We worked for the Egyptians. Let them work for us. But God's message, he reminded them that his expectations of them fell true. They did not obey. And so he went on to let them know that in a form of a question, what is this? you have done. Maybe if we read God's word often enough, when we sin, we may read this and apply this to our own sinful nature where God says, what is this you have done? You have sinned. And so, what must they expect for their folly? Verse 3 says, Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they will become as thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a snare to you. Consequences of sin. Did that unfold? Yes, it did. Because they never got rid of the enemy living among them, and because they violated God's principles and his laws, the enemy became as a snare to them. In application, how ready are we to hear from God? His message is usually short, but it's always personal. What is this you have done? And fourthly, the preacher was God himself. He spoke to all the children of Israel. His message was short and personal, and then there was a response from the people. The response was remarkable. We read in verse 4. And it came about when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. <laughs> yeah. They wept. What a remarkable response. It's the response that should uh, 
that we should apply each time we sin. It's, it's a response of weeping before a holy God because we have sinned and we have offended him. It says the people lifted up their voices and expressed an expression of sorrow for their sins against their own folly and ingratitude. But what about their motive? The angel of the Lord had previously threatened them with the judgment of God. We read it in verse 3. That this is what God said he would do. He would allow the enemy to become a snare. And he would not drive them out from their midst. And as a result, hearing the judgment that God would impose upon them and had imposed upon them, they wept. But we have to look at their motive. You know... Uh, A parent, particularly, you know, the maternal instincts of a mother, knows the depth of the cries of her children. <laughs> Sometimes fathers too, but usually mothers. They know the depth of that cry. They know if it's just a, a gimmick. They know if it is just a, to get their attention or if it is to have their own way. Or they know when the child has been hurt. A parent, a mother knows the depth of a child's cry. But it is God who knows the motive. <laughs> God knows the motive when we cry because of our sin to him. Is it because he's threatened us that we cry? Or is it because there's that deep sorrow and anguish? God, I have sinned against you like David did. When he sinned against God with Bathsheba and he cried out to him for forgiveness. God knows the motive. Tears alone were insufficient. Yes, the children of Israel, they wept. Tears were insufficient. They wept. But we do not find that they were reformed. We do not find that they turned away from their sin. The idols remain in their homes and in their hearts. Verses 16 and 9 to 19 tell us this in the same chapter 2. And the Lord raised up judges who delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. And they did, what, and they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot after their gods and bowed themselves down to them. They turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of the enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. But it came about when the judge died that they would turn back to act more corruptly than their fathers in, the f in following other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. They did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. <laughs> that tells it in a nutshell. And so whereby our tears can represent an act of sorrow, yet God knows the motive. And for these bunch of Israelites, it wasn't too long after, as the, as the title of today's sermon says, tears that dry too quickly. If we have offended God and we bow in tears unto him, let not the tears dry too quickly. Let us not fall back into that reputation of sinning all over again. The tears were insufficient. The tears dried too quickly. They also didn't benefit from the previous generations. They didn't. They went contrary to what their forefathers would have done. But God had a plan. He sent them a man after his own heart, 
he sent them in his provision for a king. Not Saul, he sent them King David so that there would be one government over all Israel. Something they had been looking and hoping for. Their choice was poor through Saul, but God had appointed God, King David. He had set the pace, he had set the tone for his coming king, his coming Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, to govern a people of his own. And so God had a plan. He sent to them a man after his own heart. He sent to them King David. When we weep for our sins, in closing, when we weep for our sins, let them not dry too quickly. Remember, God knows our motive. Let us pray. Eternal God, we, we thank you for the history of your word, for the beautiful stories like we find in Ruth and we find in Samuel, a time where judges would have ruled. Yet, Lord, we see the destruction. We see the, the children of Israel moving away from the love of God. Oh, Father, today as we carry out the works of your church, we pray that we would listen to your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus who made it all possible on Calvary so that we can have eternal salvation. Today as we worship, might we worship because we have come to hear from you. And we pray that your word would have spoken to our hearts. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.